Welcome to Walk in the Spirit, an expository teaching of God's Word. Walk in the Spirit is the audio outreach ministry of Pocatello Baptist Church. It is our prayer and desire that with the help of this message, we all will learn to walk in the Spirit. So one of the dangers or one of the blessings, however you want to look at it, I consider it more of a blessing than the danger of being a verse-by-verse guy going through the Bible is you're going to run into passages that you just wish you could skip over. And uh, I'm not going to lie to you. This is one of those ones that's been uh, long misunderstood and been controversial even to this day in churches. But I believe with all my heart that if we allow the Spirit to teach us and the words to say what it actually says, that we will not have a misunderstanding and no one will go away offended. And that is my honest to, to, to a goodness belief here. But I want to just begin this morning. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen uh, Father the Bride 2. I'm not necessarily encouraging the show. Okay, I've been years since I've seen it. I have no idea what it's exactly like anymore. Um, but uh, Father the Bride 2 is Steve Martin. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. But uh, there's a scene in there where Steve Martin and his wife are selling their home. And uh, there's a Middle Eastern couple that comes to look at their home and uh, to buy it from them. And the wife begins to, uh, comes out, the Middle Eastern wife comes out next to her husband and, and begins to speak to him. And uh, like in very quick tones and, 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 and a different language, obviously. And uh, all of a sudden, the, the, the husband, the Middle Eastern husband, looks at his wife and he's like, Makai Klim! Now, uh, immediately the wife feels like a scolded dog, put her head down and just quiet. And I remember we laughed so hard at that scene in particular because later on Steve Martin would try to do the same to his own bride. But, uh, and so from that point forward, uh, Sean and I, in, 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 our, in our relationship, we, we, have, we, we use that sometimes. Or she'll, we'll be having a, d- a discussion, we'll be joking around these or something like that. And I'll look at her and be like, Clem! And uh, she'll, like this, obviously in a very joking manner. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, there are some who have taught that this is a woman's role. That uh, when it comes to the church in particular, that the women are supposed to be these just uh, submissive, all like quiet, you know, kind of almost like, remember how I used to say about children, they should be seen and not heard kind of idea, right? There were many years and centuries when this is what the church would teach about the women's role to, to a certain extent within the body of Christ. But I want to start this morning by using my wife as an example again, and that is to simply say this. I can say with all the confidence in the world and unashamedly that I stand before you this morning a man that would say that each and every one of you should give praise to God for my wife. Not for who she just is in your life, but for the fact that I can honestly tell you that I would not be nearly the man I am today without her. I would have been, uh, I, I would have been a wreck. I would have uh, failed several times over uh, in my walk with Christ. But because of my wife, she has been a, a, a true blessing to me. She has been everything that God created her to be in my life. And I, I pray I've been everything that I, he created me to be in hers. But we can honestly say this. I can say this. I stand before you that she has call, been called my wife and been called to be my help meet. And I hope those words are familiar to you. Because when we think about women in particular, and I'm not picking on women this morning. Men, you're going to get your shot this morning too. When we think about women, one of the things we should think about, in particular, even as we read the passage this morning, the Apostle Paul even thought about it, we should think about the first couple in the Bible, Adam and Eve. So we should automatically start to think about what was their relationship like? What was it designed to be like, if I can put it to you that way? Because if we start to get the understanding of what God designed it to be like, then we're going to understand what the church should be designed to be like as well, aren't we? So let's just start there. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, if you would. And I'm going to tell you honestly, I'm going to have some verses we're going to go to this morning that uh, I don't have a slide for. I didn't prepare one for, but that's okay. Genesis chapter 2, I did. Genesis chapter 2, when you get there, let's just look at verse 18 through 22. I'm not going to go through the whole account of all creation again. But I do want to just read this passage right here together, if you would. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. It says, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And I think every man in the mo- world, for the most part, will say amen to that, right? It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, to every fowl of the air, and, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called to every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and every beast of the field, but for every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. 
And the Lord God called a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and clothed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, first of all, we note that the woman was created to be what? A help meet. This is important for us to understand. This is vital for us to understand. It, 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 because she was not created to, to, uh, to rule over him. She, God didn't take him from his head. God didn't take her, take her from his foot. God took her from his side. She was supposed to be beside him, a help meet, his partner, if I can put it to you that way. If I can put it this way, a counterpart to. That's what the, 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 the Hebrew word help meet is. It's nagid. It means counterpart. And so we understand that she was created to be a counterpart. Now, I also want you to note something else in the idea that she took him from a rib. What is the rib cage designed to do? I am not a medical professional by any means, but I do know one thing, that when you've got a broken rib, one of the hardest things it is to, it to do is breathe, isn't it? And also, when you've got a, you know, if the ribs break far enough, depending on where it's at, it's protecting, if I can put it to you, so your rib cage protects your vital organs, doesn't it? Likewise, in, in, a, in a relationship between a husband and a wife, this is what's supposed to be happening. There's a, there's a certain part that my wife, I know, protects me from a lot of the things that are going on. I know because she carries on some stress and every once in a while she'll talk to me about them. But the truth of the matter is we ought to understand that, this, that, that God never, even God's creation and God's design, we must be sure to recognize in our examination of that, that God in the creation itself showed us that women were not lesser they weren't, a set, they weren't a creature that was below us. And there's been far too long the church has gotten this wrong. And it comes from misunderstanding of passages like the one we're looking at today. So I want to say before we start our examination, the Lord would have been first to make sure that women were revered, not worshipped as some cultures do, revered, not trampled as some cultures do, as others, but give in place, if I put it to you that way. You can see this evidence throughout the scriptures, in particular, if you think of even the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ's life and how he handled his relationships with women. Now, I'm not saying he was in a marriage relationship. Do not get me wrong. But he, would, he did have relationships with women the same way I have relationships with a lot of you, my sisters in Christ. And, he, and so he had interactions with them. And how did he handle his interactions with them? Well, think about his mother, for example. One of the last things he did upon the cross was to make sure his mother was taken care of. You know, we can look at other women. We can look, at, we can look not only at his mother, we can look at uh, 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 Mary and Martha and how he treated them with kindness and respect and the loss of their brother and, 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 and met for their needs. We can look at Mary Magdalene, um, who was the first who had seen the Lord in his risen state. We can look at the woman at the well, who was the very first person that he revealed himself to be the Messiah to. So if you think that Christ, God Almighty, has a problem with women and thinks less of them somehow, then you really don't understand the Bible. Now, I say that my wife is my help me, and she truly has been my help me. She's also been my example. She's led me in encouraging ways that no other one person could have been. She's given me confidence, aside from my Lord himself, that I would never would have had. And she honestly is somebody I can say I have more respect for than anyone else in my life than my Lord Jesus Christ. So, then, what are we to learn about the role of women in the church from our passage this morning? Let's go ahead and turn back there together. I want to begin, and, and like I said, we're not going to get through it all this morning, guys. There's just way too much for us to cover. But I want to make sure that we take this, uh, this, this counsel, the counsel of God and, 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 and the, from the Scriptures, but we must be sure to make sure we take the whole counsel of God and not just the little bits and pieces here and there. Because as we read this passage, let's just start off in verse 9. It says there, in like manner also. I want to pause there for one moment if you would. If I can put it to you this way, it says, in the same way. That's another way of saying like manner. In the same way. So what is he taking, making reference to? Well, let's begin here. He's making reference to the things he's already taught. And what did we learn last week? Just jumping up one verse, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner. In the same way. Women should pray. What? Yes. This is going to be one of those things I'm going to be honest with you guys about. Now, we, 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 we have to take it into the whole context that men were taught to pray, and as it said there in verse 8, what does it say? Everywhere. Everywhere. Well, what does everywhere mean? Well, this is going to be a tough one for you. You ready? Everywhere. 
If I was to put it to you this way, remember the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says these words to us. It says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything gives thanks for this, the will of Christ and Jesus concerning you. So pray without ceasing and pray everywhere. Now, is that only for the men? No, in like manner, women should be willing to pray. Now, I will say this. Jump down to verse 11 with me, if you will. It says this in our text. In verse 11, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Ooh. Right? And I, I, I can't lie to you guys. This is one of those times I'm like, Lord, why do I got to be the one standing up here right now? Let the women learn in, all subject, in, all, in silence. Now, I want you to notice a very important word in that. Right? It says in verse 11 of our text right there, it says, Let the woman learn. Notice we're not talking about prayer anymore, are we? See, we're talking about a whole nother subject. We're going to talk more about this next week, okay? I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to get too much down that road this morning with you. But we're not talking about prayer anymore. We're talking about learning. We're talking about the study of God's Word. We're talking about those things like that. And we'll get down that road a little bit further on late next week. But here's what we need to understand is, can women pray? Well, that's a great question. So this is where I told you I'm going to go off text with you guys for a minute. So let's just start in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, the very beginning of the church. Let's see what happened in the very beginning of the church, shall we? Acts chapter 1. And when you get there, turn, look at verse 13 with me if you would. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. All right, so far I've lost one man and one woman. I'm doing okay. All right, I'm teasing. I know the other things to do. Acts chapter, th chapter 1, verse 13, and read through verse uh, 14, if you would. We read these words. And when they were come in, they went up into the upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Ze the Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Do you understand that even in the very beginning of the church, they got together, they prayed, who was there? The women. Can women pray? Continue on, Acts chapter 2. Let's go to the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. After Peter gives his speech at the day of Pentecost, this is what it says, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And the breaking of bread and in prayers. So, and then we continue on. Just, I will read through verse 47. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them and the men and women as when every man had need. And they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. All the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So are we to assume that the only people who got saved on the day of Pentecost are men? Because if we're supposed to assume that, then we can say that only men should pray. But it said everyone who got saved did what? They broke bread, they prayed, they supplicated, they, they, they all prayed together. So we can sit there, we can assume, if we want to, that only men got saved. The women came later, I guess. But we already know there were women there, don't we? There were those who were disciples of Christ that were women that were already there. And unless you think uh, I, I'm making this up and that the apostle, well, this is, you know, whatever. Apostle Paul now is instructing us. Because there's some who want to argue, yeah, but what does Paul say about it? We just read what Paul said about it, right? Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for our last off the, off the books kind of turn here. I apologize. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There's a reason I kind of left these off the book, guys. I want you to see them. I want you to turn to them. I want you to see them. I want you to be familiar with them. Okay? Acts chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 11, excuse me. Let's just read verses 1 through 4 together, if you would. By the way, Apostle Paul writing. Be ye followers of me, even as I am also am of Christ. 
Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now pause there for one second. So here we have, now I'm not going to get into the head covering things. This is a whole other study for another day, okay? But in short, I'll tell you this. Christ is our covering, period, okay? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now listen to these words. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So is Paul saying that women should pray and prophesy? Because that's what I just read. I don't know about you guys, but that's what I just read. Now, prophesy, by the way, doesn't necessarily just mean the, uh, the, like when you think about the prophets of old, Samuel, and so on and so forth. It also means to teach, to instruct. Now, later on, we'll have ideas on what w w women teaching and instructing, won't we, in the Bible. But the truth of the matter is this, is understand, Paul's not prohibiting them from praying. As a matter of fact, I would say, why would he even write that if women weren't allowed to pray? Why would Paul even give us that instruction? Now, I want to say this, before I go any further down this road with you all. Just like there are men who are uncomfortable praying publicly, it's okay for a woman to be uncomfortable praying publicly as well. Not everybody has to get up and pray. Not everybody, when we have our Wednesday night prayer service, not every woman who doesn't feel like she wants to pray has to pray the same way that not every man who doesn't feel like he wants to pray has to pray. There's no, nothing that says, well, you're more godly or ungodly if you pray or don't pray. I hope you have a prayer life. But nothing says that you have to do those things. There are men I know that serve in this body that, that, that for example, to come up and take the offering that I won't call upon to pray because they're not comfortable with the idea of praying. Really? Yeah. Now, I, teach, I, I say all this, guys, because I want you to remember that, that, uh, that we could look at even Old Testament examples of this. For example, we could turn back to Hannah when she was at the temple, right? Now, she, she was praying at the temple. What? Yes. Now, granted, you could read through there. You could say that she was praying in her heart. Her lips moved, but she made no noise. I don't know how many have ever actually tried to move your lips without really making a noise, okay? But she, her lips moved. And you remember Eli thought she was drunk, the, the, the priest, right? Eli the priest thought she was drunk. And so what does Eli do? He rebukes her and says, woman, why did you come here and be drunk? He didn't rebuke her for being there praying. He didn't say, you shouldn't come to the temple and pray. What's the matter with you, woman? Go home behind your husband. Hi. Whoever that was. Anyway, he, he didn't say that. He rebuked her because he thought he, she was drunk. Not because she was praying. See, it's Old Testament, New Testament, guys, the same. The women can pray, that, and that's what I want you to understand. The women can, and uh, by all means, should pray. And I'll be honest with you, um, when we're together, even as a family around our table doing our morning devotions, uh, my wife, sometimes her prayers blow me away. I'm like, wow, Lord, what a heart. And isn't that what prayer is? It's a conversation with God. All right, some of you might be sitting there thinking, well, I don't know if that necessarily covers it all. Okay, you ready? I watched this morning as we were singing our opening hymns, and I saw a lot of women singing. You know what singing is? You know what worship is? It's prayer. What are you doing singing, women? Be quiet. I mean, see, see how ridiculous do you want to make this notion? How far do you want to go with this? The, the, the difficulty comes from the fact that I'm being... Be, really honest with you guys right now. It comes from the, it comes from the history of, of men who want to hold women in subjection and think of them as being a lesser being. When that is not how God designed it to be. I understand why men do that. You want the honest moment of truth from a man's heart. Women, you want to know why we act that way? We're threatened by you. Because we know that you're probably smarter than us. We just don't want you to know it. All right? I mean, in all honesty, you guys, you guys have more feelings, you care more. You, I mean, there's, the, there's a reason why men go out in the field, <laughs> all right? Have you ever listened to a guy's conversation? We grunt pretty much, right? Yeah, why that? Huh? Yeah. Greg knows we're going out to lunch tomorrow. All right? <laughs> all right? I just invited him. You didn't hear it? I'm just kidding you. Anyway, 
But I mean, in all honesty, it, that's, we, we understand this. Now, I want to say, guys, here's, here, here's the point. In like manner also, women should pray. Women should pray and pray everywhere. And pray in the same manner that men pray. Don't be afraid of a prayer life. Now, remember I said learn. And I want to talk real quick before I go off of prayer. Unfortunately, there are some of us who think our prayer life is about preaching. How many people have you ever seen in your lifetime who get up and pray a sermon? Right? They get up and they start, oh, you're just, I'm going to do that, right? I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm guilty of doing it after the service, aren't I? When I pray, close the praying, oh, Lord, and then I'm going to go over thinking of everything again because they didn't hear it the first time. Okay? But the truth, but the truth is this, guys, is we've got to understand that, that, that there's a difference. In our prayer life, that's a communication. And we're one family. We're one body. And we're all members of one body, and we need each and every individual part of this body. And I need each and every individual that's part of this body to function right. Because if this body doesn't function right, some of us have, I mean, the older I get, the more I realize I don't function correctly anymore. All right? Uh, things hurt, and they just hurt for no reason. I go to the doctor, tell them they hurt. They're like, yeah, okay, good. I guess that's just the way it is. But it just happens that way. We need every part of the body to function correctly. So I'm telling you right now, and I, 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 and I believe with all my heart that Scripture bears out, there's nothing the matter with women praying. Especially on whatever day now was when Eddie told them they couldn't. All right? Every day, everywhere, there's nothing that would prohibit you from praying. All right, back in our text now. All right, here we go. Continue on. That went, verse 9, in like manner also. And then that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with same facedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. All right. Women adorn themselves. This is one of those things that every man loves to do, tell a woman how to dress. We don't even like to answer you when you ask us if it looks good. Does it look good on me? Yes. That's the right answer anytime. Gentlemen, if you're not married yet, that's the right answer. Yes. Okay? Yes, it does. Okay? But, so here we get into this area where now we're starting to deal with the, the, the important part of this verse, the important part of this instruction comes in verse 10. But what's becometh a woman professing God in with good works? Is the way that you're adorning yourself, the way you're dressing, um, is it professing godliness? That's the real question, isn't it? Now here we go. All right, we're going to break this down. You guys ready? Because that's what we do, okay? Women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame fadeness, shame face, shame face, let's try it in English. Modest apparel with shame facedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So you're not supposed to wear broided hair, gold, pearls, or costly array, women. Is that what he's really saying? Well, let's just look at another text. Remember, proof text, right? First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here because my wife has been, uh, with the women's study, they've been going through the book of First Peter together. So I'm sure you guys have gotten to this point. First Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any, uh, any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. That's the conduct of their wives. That's what that conversation means, the way you behave yourself. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Okay. So, in the last one, we saw the prohibit prohibitation of wearing braided hair and gold and costly and things, arrays and stuff, right? So let's look at it in this text. What does it say here? Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair, of the wearing of gold, or the putting on of apparel. So are we supposed to understand that women should not have braided hair, or broided hair, excuse me, broided hair, or wear gold? 
Well, let's just assume the answer to these questions is yes. Let's just look at this one to begin with. It says, so let it not be the plating of the hair. That means to be braided hair. Women, you don't get to braid your hair ever. Ever. If we're going to assume that's what it's saying, it's saying, yes, don't braid your hair. Now, how many women who, who, who profess godliness wear braided hair? How many women have you known who, who, who are godly that wear braided hair? But you can't take it out. That's what the Bible says. Okay? You can't wear braided hair. But then it goes on from there, doesn't it? And it says, you can't wear gold either. What? Men, this is awesome for us. Right? Wedding rings, right? It's now going to go back to that little, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the little paper thing. I don't have to get you, oh, well, silver. Nope. Is that what it's really saying? See, the problem was we have to understand what they used to do is they used to braid their hair in a manner that was uh, and it meant to, to basically, they'd wrap it around themselves in a manner that would make them look very sexual. They used to wear their gold in areas of their body that would attract the eye to the gold to attract the man or to ma attract men in a sexual manner. If you're doing that, then yeah, you know what? You need to stop. But let's just assume that these are main, that's what these mean because then we get to our next one, right? What's the third one? Or the putting on of apparel. Whoa. You mean women aren't supposed to be dressed? How many churches do you stand up, see stand up saying, women, no more coming to church dressed. See, the point is this, guys, is we have to look at this in the logical terms and what, the, what they're really saying here. Is he really saying women can't braid, the, braid their hair? No. He's saying don't do it in a manner that all you're trying to do with your life is to attract a man, to look like this sexual being. Don't wear gold. Don't do it in a manner that would try to make you look like a sexual being and attract them. Don't put on your apparel to it in a manner that would try to just do nothing but be sexual and attract men. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying, simply put. And by the way, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying too. Go ahead and turn back in our text again if you would. Modest apparel. Well, what would be modest? Well, I'm going to be honest with you all right now. You ready for this? There's some who would say that modesty has to be a dress. There's some who would say that modesty has to be, you know, uh, you know the... the um, um, Long, long, longer dresses than just a dress. And, and there's some who would say that modesty can only be like loose flowing clothes or whatever the case may be. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that what modesty is this, it comes in the answer of the same, t the same passage where it says this, modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness means bashfulness. There is only one man I want my wife to try to attract, and that's me. So she needs to be dressing in a manner that's pleasing to me, not to everybody else, right? Now, I, I don't want to make it sound like I got a thumb on Chandra and tell her everything she can wear, because I'm just like every other guy. That look good? Yes. Now, I will be honest. You can ask my wife. There have been things she's put on that I've told her no. Nope. You can't wear that. It's a little too revealing. Because as I'm her husband sitting there, and I'm not trying to be crude here, guys, but as I'm her husband sitting there watching her get that clothes on, and I think to myself, all I can do is to want to get those clothes off, there's a problem, isn't there? I mean, let's just be honest. There's a problem there. And if I'm thinking that, what about all the worldly men or the lustful men that I know that are out there? That's the problem. So shame faith me. Be bashful. Think about what you're doing. What are you trying to present? And be sober about it. That means to think logically about it. What does that mean? Just because it's fashionable doesn't mean it's a fashion you should wear. All right, I'm going to pick on one. You guys ready for this? Yoga pants. Why even wear them? Leave very little to the imagination, ladies. I'm sorry, but it does. Spanx, whatever. Leave very little to the imagination. Is that bashful? Are you being modest in that? And that's up to you to decide, by the way. I'm not trying to tell you, but I'm going to tell you right now, as a man, I've told my wife, I said, yeah, you can wear yoga pants as long as there's a dress over them. Or pants. Or a robe. <laughs> All right? And you've seen, she had, she had the, the little tight tights that are colored and stuff like that, but she wears them with the dress and so on and so forth. She didn't just run around in them. And I'm not saying you have to be like my wife, women. I'm just telling you, here's the problem. When my wife put those on, I think to myself, what are they really looking at? 
Well, if I put it to you this way, it's like if she puts on those flower-colored ones, it looks like she's just wearing tattoos. You know what I'm saying? There's a little bit to the imagination. So let it be that woman, modest, shame-faced, sober. And here's the real point. And even Peter said this. You'll remember this. He said, let it be the inward man, not the outward man, didn't he? Here's the point in verse 10. But what's becometh a woman professing godliness with good works. That is the point. When you meet somebody, and actually, you know what, before I go into this and I get too much further down this road, I want to go back up a little bit here. Men, in like manner also. See, we don't get to pick on just the women this morning. Men, you have the same problems. All right? If you have a six-pack abs, okay, I, I, I don't. All right? They're in there somewhere. At least that's what they tell me. Okay? But you have six-pack abs, and you're walking around with your shirt off all the time to show off your abs, you've got a problem. If you're wearing tank tops so you can show off your big, buff muscles all the time, you've got a problem. You're not being shamefaced. You're trying to attract the women with your body. And I'm going to be honest, there are, unfortunately, even married men who will dress up so that other women will be attracted to them. And that, it, it happens. The point is this, is we should have a modest apparel in our hearts. We should be in our hearts going, it's not about the outward adorning, it's about the inward person. So what is the first thing you want somebody to recognize about you when they meet you? I mean, in all honesty, is it that, well, they wear the latest fashions, look how good they are. Is it, is it that, well, look how buff he was, or she, right? There's some women that are buffer than I am, I know that. Okay. I mean, is that what you want them to recognize about you? As a person professing godliness, is that what you want them to recognize about you? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick on myself for a second here, guys. I told you my story in the other earring, and how I took it out when I finally wanted a job, right? I mean, a, a decent job, I should say. Okay? After I got my jobs, after Sean and I got married, I started wearing an earring again for a while. You know what I noticed? The first conversation I ended up having with people was not about Christ. This was a stumbling block to them. They didn't look at me with my earring hanging out of my ear and think to, my, think to themselves, there's a very godly young man. They didn't think that. Now, did that mean I wasn't godly? No. But I could in all my heart of rebellion go, well, they're the problem, not me. They should learn, not me. I mean, don't they know their Bible? Men wore earrings in the Bible. They were bond servants for Christ, and we make all these great excuses about why we wear earrings, didn't we? But you know what the problem was? Is I wasn't professing godliness. Oh, I may have been a godly person, but the first thing that people would think about me was not my godliness. And when the way we dress, the way what we do, the way we speak, everything like that, the first thing people should recognize about us is that our godliness. That's what they should want to recognize. That's what you should want them to recognize about you. But so many of us miss that boat. Because we're so busy trying to be like the world, we forget we're not supposed to be of the world. Can you have tattoos? Can you wear earrings? Can you wear yoga pants? Can you? Of course you can. You have liberty in Christ. But here's the truth of the matter. The question isn't can you. The question really is should you? And I'll be honest with you. It, it, for me, and this is everybody's individual heart. For me... I know that if I came up here with a big gold hoop hanging out of my ear next week, most of you'd be like, what the, he, last week he didn't wear his jacket, now he's wearing an earring and he's growing facial hair, this guy's gone off the deep end. Because you wouldn't think I'm professing godliness, would you? That's the point. This is what we're supposed to look at. What's professing godliness? Now remember, what the beginning of the verse said, in like manner also. So, also notice it says costly array. What? How many of you spend more money on your wardrobe than you do in charity? Whoa. Now, I know it's expensive, right? One pair of jeans is like 45 bucks. Unless you go to Costco, then it's like 10, 15. Okay? But those aren't cool. You know how embarrassing it is when people see Kirkland on the back of your pants? 
Well, I'll be honest with you. If they're looking at the back of my pants, they've got a problem anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's like those guys that wear the bling butt jeans. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> what is your problem, mister? There are things I don't want in my head, and that's one of them. I, but honestly, no, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy the cheapest clothes all the time. But if you're buying the fashion so that you keep up with the world, you might want to examine your heart. Ooh, I know, it hurts a little bit, doesn't it? Some of us have good excuses, though. Well, I haven't found anything that fits me except for Abercrombie and French or whatever it's called. The only shoes that are comfortable to wear are Nikes. Now, that one I kind of have to agree with, I won't lie. <laughs> Okay. But honestly, it's a costly array as well. Or you want people to look at you because they and look at your clothes and go, look at how wealthy that person must be. Look how well they're doing. Look how wonderful they must be. They wear the latest and greatest and they're the coolest and they're the neatest. And that's why I want to attract them. I want, I want people to hang around me because I actually have everything good. Okay. Next week, we're going to be a little more controversial. Next week, we're going to talk about silence. And, uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about the prohibition of what women can and cannot do in the, in the Word. But we're also going to talk about men. So don't think, men, that you're going to get off the hook. And I must apologize that I did not have the time to fully develop all of this this morning with you guys, but I don't want to do injustice to the Word of God by trying to rush through it this morning, okay? So that's why I'm not going on in the text this morning. But I, I do want to leave you with this thought before we close this morning about if I can put it this way, about what women, about women praying and also the idea of women being silent. And I want you to meditate on these, this verse, these verses this week as you think about women being silent in the church. It comes from, uh, we're right there, so turn over to 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And read these verses with me now. 14 through 17. says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, of knowing whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God as profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So I want you to think about this. Paul's writing to Timothy, and Paul says in particular in verse, six, in verse 15 that you have known the Holy Scriptures since you were a child. These have made you wise unto salvation and faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to ask yourself, where did Timothy learn the Scriptures? Thank you for studying God's Word with us on Walk in the Spirit. To hear more of this or other portions of Scripture, please visit www.pocatellobaptistchurch.com or you can write us at 190 West Chapel Road, Pocatello, Idaho, 83201. If you live in or are visiting Southeast Idaho, we would like to have you join us here at Pocatello Baptist Church for any of our services. Our service times begin with Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 10 a.m., and Sunday evening evening study at 5 p.m. We have a midweek study and prayer service for both adults and youth on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is available for all of our services. For more information or directions, please call us at 208-237-4915. Until next time, God bless you as you walk in the Spirit.